I've said some things I regret. Some of them are even etched permanently on the internet. But there are some words and several types of them that I have learned never to say in a D&D session. And I'm going to share them with you. And as an added bonus, by the end, you may learn a thing or two about history as well. We're starting with a word that has derailed more than one session of mine by taking a totally regular fantasy word and making everyone at the table rethink and overthink it. We've all heard of the classic blacksmith playing his trade in villages across the land. But this is recontextualized completely the moment that you bring out a white smith or a brown smith. Unfortunately, as less common professional smithing specialisms in fantasy media, most people's immediate thought jumps not to a niche new crafter's job to learn about, but to an implication that you've been discussing smiths in general by other categories this whole time. Nonetheless, the white smith was a massively important job in the history of smithing. So was the brown smith, for that matter. But my previous sentence hopefully highlights my point. The truth is that although the brown smith can easily be referred to by their alternate title, the copper smith, the white smith specifically doesn't really have a, a good historical second option. Oftentimes, what they did was work with lighter metals and were especially skilled at fine and precise work. These craftsmen made locks, precision tools, and were exceptionally proficient in honing and sharpening tools and weapons, a broad and undeniably useful remit. On the whole, this contrasts with the more heavy duty wares that blacksmiths had to offer and the two specialisms would sometimes collaborate as well. Besides, in our standard kind of medieval-esque fantasy world, our heroes are most likely interacting with specialist smiths like swordsmiths and weaponsmiths far more than any blacksmith who were generally better trained in making nails, tools and grates than anything a fantasy adventurer needs. The white smith, in actual fact, should be more visited by heroes in fantasy worlds than a blacksmith, generally. In a similar vein, I lost two hours of a session to another word which was historically quite common. Sweetmeats. This isn't even about it sounding that weird or potentially problematic. It quite simply just breaks people's brains. Sweet meat, Like, with added honey? Well, no. Sweet meat is a word which actually moves its way into modern English as sweets, a simple contraction of the longer historical word. This is the British English word for a sweet treat, so why not just call a sweet treat a sweet? Well, partly because sweet meats actually refers to a broader category than the English word sweets or the American candy discuss sugared fruits, as well as natural sweet foods like licorice or sugarcane, all fall under the umbrella of sweet meat, but not sweets or candy until that licorice is processed, I suppose. So if, say, you're describing a civilization which exports candied orange peel and also orange-based hard candy, the Export duties would catalogue both as sweet meats. It's a helpful and historically accurate category of thing uh, that existed. But why do I keep saying meat? These have nothing to do with any flesh based product. Well, much like how the mince meat in a good mince pie has no meat in it, sweet meats usually don't either. While I can't actually recommend using it historically correctly, meat in Old English means food, generally, or edible fare in the most general of senses. Meat is food, especially with the linguistic gap between modern British English and the rest of the English speaking world. You may be safer separating candied fruits and candy as individual categories in your world and assuming that meat means meat. Our next word is weird. No, literally. The worry with the word weird is that its modern meaning is so much less interesting than its old meaning. We can even see this in D&D. 
I've seen so many players confused at the ninth level spell by the same name, not just because it's a terrible spell, but because it doesn't make things that, well, weird. All it does is manifest the fears and nightmares of creatures and, and makes them seem real, able to do damage to the creature. Weird gets its modern meaning in the 19th century, but its original meaning refers to fate. The weird being the ability to turn or manifest fate. This incidentally fits much better into the aforementioned spell in D&D, which could easily be flavoured as summoning the fates themselves to show possible futures in a nightmarish form of visions to the creatures who are affected. Either way, the Anglo-Saxon concept of weird is almost too cool to pass up, but like Pratchett played with in Weird Sisters, it's just a little too hard to convince someone to take you seriously with your fate-bending powers when you're the Master of Weird. It sounds like a one-episode Doctor Who villain from the 80s. Unfortunately, Weird, the ancient mythic practice of manipulating the threads of fate, needs a new name. Preferably one that isn't fate-bending. Just ask any user of British English why airbending is funny. Next up, we have a general category of word that might totally break immersion among the historically inclined. But for these, you barely have a choice but to use them. What do the words Goliath, Guy, Mesmerizing, Guillotine and Shrapnel all have in common? Well, they're all named after people. It's hard enough to navigate the English language as is, but when Guy Fawkes messes Mesmer, Guillotine and Shrapnel and the biblical villain Goliath are all lending their names to various fairly common terms in fantasy realms, it's really quite hard to avoid one of your NPCs accidentally implying that Jesus exists in your world. It goes further than people's names too. How the mighty have fallen, the good Samaritan, the writing on the wall and by the skin of one's teeth are all expressions unlikely to exist without the translation of the biblical record into English. Especially the Good Samaritan, which also just how happens to refer to a specific historical population group. This may strike you as incredibly nitpicky, and in fairness, it is. Especially considering that English itself wouldn't exist in a fantasy world anyway. So we can just note the weirdness of all of this and move on. I personally actually love Tolkien's solution to this particular problem. Sure, uh, this was all written originally in a different language, but I've taken the liberty of translating it into English using modern idioms that my reader will understand. And that's a really fun way to deal with this massive, massive linguistic problem of accidentally implying things simply by the words you're commonly using. For some honourable mentions, we're going to start with words which are just kind of bad now. There's no merit in using the old word for a bundle of sticks, and we have absolutely no need to use language that makes anyone at our table uncomfortable. If you feel like you have to ask before using a word, why bother using it at all? The English language is such a broad language that you can probably find something that does the job just as well. We play these games to have a good time at the end of the day. I don't care if your medieval-esque merchant wouldn't use the word decelerate. It's not helpful in any way to use the more historically accurate concept of retardation. Anyway, again, I doubt your fantasy characters are even speaking English anyway, so what's the bloody use? Second honourable mention is oldie worldy language. This is just a personal bugbear, but I have seen thy, thee, thou and thine misused just one too many times. And also, it's not ye old. It's never been ye old. That Y is just how we used to write th. Finally, I want to talk about butts. Not because I expect a player to find them cripplingly funny, but because they can also be confusing. For those bewildered at how a butt can possibly be confusing, I'll spare you the your mama joke. It's a historic measure of alcohol. Other words specifically for beer include firkin, hogshead, and tongue. 
fun words, but they're really quite useless to the average modern person. Congratulations, by the way, to anyone who actually knows the size order of these things. Uh, a butt is bigger than a hogshead. Hogsheads trump firkins and tons are the biggest of them all. But this is really emblematic of a wider point that I have to make. In our attempts at historicity, or simply sounding cool, all sorts of old school measurements can be confusing for different people for different reasons. I say this with some authority as a member of a country with perhaps the least sensible grasp of measurements. We use miles and feet for roads and height, buy our bottles in litres, beer and milk in pints, our tons weigh more than American ones, and metres determine how far you can run. For the love of all that is sensible, stick to one system and keep it as simple as possible. Don't bother with fathoms and leagues unless your players are sailors. And try to use the measurement system that more of your players are familiar with so that you can all have a shared visual understanding of the world you're in. I mean, it is kind of hard when you're playing a game with imperial measurements baked into its very design, uh, but that's beside the point here. Stick to the simplest system that works with your game and your players. It's not that immersion breaking to say, we're transporting a hundred liters of wine. Or just saying, two large barrels. Heck, we already all do this for money. To such a point where players complain about Electrum pieces being confusing. Don't get fancy with weights and measures. It just bogs down the fantasy and leaves people confused and everyone imagining something different. Especially if you describe a cellar filled to the brim with butts. I hope you've enjoyed this little pedantic deep dive into language and history and find these tips useful in the future. If you'd like more videos in this style, please do let me know and do all the lovely YouTube things as well. But with all that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.